Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions. We are talking about the tips and tricks related to the foundation level certification examinations and helping you to pass your examination in your very first attempt. Well, in this particular tutorial, we'll be stepping into the chapter 3 and trying to understand what kind of questions can be expected when it comes to static testing and uh, will that be of different complexity for sure and helping you the tips and tricks related to that. So let's get started. The very first question from this chapter in the series is question number 15 and we are talking about this question as which of the following is not a benefit of static testing. Now, of course, uh, we need to first recall, given that the context is very clear, that in our mind, we should start recalling what is static testing, what is not, and what are the common benefits of having static testing being conducted in the life cycle. And some of these options would be very crazy and driving you a little deviating from the context. So just be attentive with every single word which are mentioned here. So let's start with our discussions right from the first. So option A says, having less expensive defect management due to the ease of detecting defects later in the SDLC looks perfectly fine. Amazing option because the objective of static testing is all about benefit test, uh, benefit of uh, detecting defects early in the life cycle. But hold on, didn't it say another word that is later in the life cycle? Have a look here. So it says ease of detecting defects later in SDLC. But all we remember from our previous discussions is that the static testing is something which is beneficial when conducted early in the life cycle because static testing is an approach of non-executable review and analysis of the work products. And certainly this helps if you identify them early in the life cycle, not in dynamic testing. So dynamic testing is something which is performed later, but static testing can be done earlier in the life cycle. So later is one, just, just that one word which could take this entire option away and I may think of this as a benefit, but actually it is not. So that's where I think option A looks pretty much uh, the you know right answer, but let's cross check with other options as well. Remember, whenever you think you have got the right answer as the very first option, do justify yourself that why do you think the other options are not correct? So always read all the options, even if you are very confident that this is the right answer. Okay, so let's look at the option B. Option B says, Fixing defects found during static testing is generally much less expensive than fixing defects found during dynamic testing. Yes, the cost of fixing defects later in the life cycle are higher than that of earlier because in earlier phases, we have limited work products, not too much of work done. So rework would be limited and minimize the cost. Whereas when during dynamic testing, a defect is found related to misunderstanding of requirement, then the amount of rework would be very high because we have to rectify the requirement, we have to redesign it, we have to re-implement it, and then retesting will happen. And in fact, dynamic testing also invites root causes. If you remember, static testing directly finds a defect without root cause analysis. So in that context, the cost of fixing the defect is cheaper compared to dynamic testing. Okay, so that's why static testing is cheaper and this is one of the benefit, right? But the question is about not. So always be considerate about the word not in the examination questions because sometimes they would just not be readable. You would just come to the context. Very easy to ignore that because it will be written in the normal small letters itself. In my slides, it are in capital just to make sure that you pay attention to it, right? Let's go to option C. Option C says, finding coding defects that might not have been found only by performing dynamic testing. We know that dynamic testing is limited to UI related executions and UI related executions do not promise to you that you have executed every single line of code. There would always be a possibility that some of the part of the code is never executed as a part of uh, dynamic testing. And that is where we do static analysis, which is scanning through the code statically to find anomalies in the code. And yes, that's where it is one of the benefit again. And talking about the option D, option D says detecting gaps and inconsistencies in requirement is I think is a direct benefit of static testing because that can be achieved by conducting reviews on the requirements by getting together. So if keeping it very straight and very uh, to the point, I think this makes it very clear that the benefits are well listed here and the 
not a benefit is right here on the top. So put together the right answer here for this particular question is A. Having less expensive defect management due to ease of detecting defects later in the SDLC. And just now you understood that how each and every single word may contribute to a meaningful response. And that is where people generally go wrong. So please be careful with every single word you read during the examination. So let's move on to the next question. And the next question we have is question number 16. And the question number 16 is talking about the early and frequent feedback, which says, which of the following is a benefit of early and frequent feedback? the benefit of early and frequent feedback. So we should again, as usual, uh, look forward to recall what we know about early and frequent feedbacks from our discussions. But let's go with the options here. The option A says it improves the test process for future projects. This process is different than that of early and frequent feedback. So let me just talk about it quickly because we have tutorials to support it. So early and frequent feedback is basically to interact with the business and present them what exactly we do as a part of our implementation and reflect them to show them with a demonstration that hey so far we have implemented this much and what do you think about it is that something getting aligned to your requirement your needs and your expectations or you think we are getting deviated and that is where early and frequent frequent means consistently it should not be done just for one sprint but after that you don't do it is not the case here so consistency simply means that every single sprint we should demonstrate to the business that how are we progressing. So early and frequent feedback basically aligns you to that of the customer expectations when the requirements are poorly defined or sometimes the requirements are a little vague in terms of like not having all the details what we need really to be a very confident person. So in this case, of course, uh, this is not a benefit we are talking about. It does not help you to improve the test process. Let's look at the option B. It forces customers to prioritize their requirement based on agreed risk. I think again, it not forces the customers. We have a risk-based testing approach or PBI is one of the way by which we basically do that. So PBI is back product backlog items and we have a session for that, which is product backlog grooming and refinement where businesses look forward to prioritize. And it's a responsibility of the business to prioritize their requirements. It's not a responsibility of our team or our team does not force the business to do that. So it's a very common process that the business knows what exactly they want to see next and the business will do the prioritizations on all the product backlog items, that is PBIs. So it's not that we force them or early and frequent feedback force them to do so. It's not about forcing at all. That's the wrong word. So let's go to option C. Option C says it provides a measure for the quality of changes. Quality of changes? It's, it's not a measure of quality of changes because CR, that is change request, is different. And quality on top of it is something different again. So it's not that, first of all, the CRs are improved uh, with respect to this. Of course, I can say that based on our demonstrations, the business will have certain ad additional ideas and CRs can be given to you. That is change requests can be offered to you from the business that, hey, is there a possibility we can modify this? Is there a possibility we can do something like this? So you will have initiation of change request by having this early and frequent feedback, but it is not about the quality of change request. That is quality is always done by testing, but not by early and frequent feedback. Okay, so to introduce CRs, but not define the quality of CR that we will have to measure. So this is again, not a benefit of early and frequent feedback. Now we are left with one option and that is D. It helps avoid requirements misunderstanding exactly by discussions from the initial uh, topic, uh, like from the option on whatever we dis dis described to you about early and frequent feedback, it says that we get aligned to that of what is business expectations. Sometimes we may not understand their need by just having a very high level user story. And that is where having early and frequent feedback, which is interaction with the business and demonstrating them could give us a better clarity. So put together, the right answer for this particular question is D, it helps avoid requirement misunderstanding by conducting early and frequent feedback. I hope that gives you a lot of understanding about tackling these exam questions with ease during the examination. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning. Thank you.